Hey there, Pal Church family and friends. It is great to be here with you for worship. Whether you are here with us in the building or you have joined us online, gathering with one another is so important and we are grateful to be together on this day. My name is Brad Hyde and it's my joy to be one of the pastors here at Powell Church, but even though I'm a pastor, I am by no means perfect, but enough about me. I wanna tell you about who we are as a church. We are a group of believers who seek to love God with everything that we have and to love each other into a closer relationship with Jesus. We desire to grow closer to God and grow closer to one another through Bible study and prayer and worship. We wanna serve our local community, the city of Knoxville and the world, just as Jesus taught us to do. And then we are called to go, to go and to be the church wherever we're at. If that sounds like something that you would like to be a part of, we would love to connect with you. There are several ways that you can do this. You can go to palchurch.com and fill out the connect card there on the home page, or you can email us at connect at palchurch.com. You can sign up for our e-newsletter, download the Church Center app, or fill out the Connect card that is on the bottom of the info sheet that you received when you came in today. Share with us your prayer requests as well on the other side of that card, or you can do that online and leave those with guest services when you leave the building this day, or you can put them in the offering bags as well later in the service. We wanna be praying for you. Now, let's prepare our hearts to hear a word from God on this day that God has given to us. You know you are in Tennessee if the Saturday before Palm Sunday it snows. And it is Palm Sunday, and didn't our children do a beautiful job of opening worship for us today? I'm so grateful for the mission and ministry of Christy Pittman. She does such a beautiful job with our children. And, you know, that starts at birth and it goes all the way up through college. And Dawson Kitts takes them over at the youth age. And I am so grateful for these ministries. Well, it is Palm Sunday. And I, I have it on good authority from my favorite climatologist, who just happens to be my husband, that it is very unlikely that it would snow in springtime in Jerusalem. So, if you will permit me, let me set the scene. It's the final week before the crucifixion. It's springtime. It's somewhere around the year 30 AD. Olive trees dot the landscape. The almond trees are just completing their blooming. They have these pinkish blooms. Farmers are pruning the grapevines. Wheat is bending in the field. The soil is rich. It's dark and brown and, and red and black. And the sky above is just filled with clouds. Sparrows and hummingbirds and robins, they all come in for a landing on the branches and they, and they suckle the juice from those pink blooms on the almond trees. And there's a man, a Jewish man. His name is Jesus and he's from the town of Nazareth. He's been preaching and teaching and he's been healing and doing miracles all around this region for about three years. He's collected a pretty large following of Jews. They believed that he was the Son of God and that he was their long-awaited Messiah. That following grew. It became even larger when Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. You see, many Jews, they saw Jesus perform this miracle and, and they truly believed. But some did not. And they reported what Jesus had done to this group of, of legal experts, the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they were along with Jewish high priests. They were a, a governing group. And there was a meeting of their governing council. They were called the Sanhedrin. And the members of the Sanhedrin knew that if they allowed Jesus to continue doing what he was doing, everybody would believe in him. And the current Jewish leaders would have nothing. And the high priest Caiaphas spoke up and he said, 
it would be better for one man to die than for the whole nation to lose everything. And from that moment on, when Caiaphas spoke up, they plotted to end his life. Now it was almost time for the Jewish festival of Passover and it was customary that all the Jews would go to Jerusalem for that festival because that's where their temple was. And the chief priests and the Pharisees were on the lookout. They had given orders to anyone who had found Jesus to report it so they could arrest him. Now Jesus was in fact planning on going to Jerusalem for the Passover but he stopped at his friend's house. Lazarus. He stopped in Bethany to see Lazarus. Now in Bethany, there was a huge dinner given in his honor, and there were loads of people there. A large crowd began to gather, not only to see Jesus, but to see Lazarus. He had been raised from the dead, and it's one of those things, you can't believe it till you see it, right? Everybody wanted to see this guy who had been raised from the dead. And then it came time for Jesus to make his way to the temple. Now, if Jesus had wanted to slip in through a side door a little quietly in order to avoid being noticed, then he he was out of luck. If he thought the crowd in Bethany was large, he hadn't seen anything yet. This great crowd in Jerusalem had gathered for the festival They heard Jesus was on his way, and they treated him like royalty. They put their cloaks out on the ground, spreading their cloaks out, and they made a path for him to the city. We're going to read this morning from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 21, and there's a verse that's going to be in bold. I'm going to ask you to help me out and help me read that. If you will, please direct your attention to the screen and hear the word of God. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the fall of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that the crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Help me out here. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Say it one more time. Say it like you know him. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Say it one more time and this time say it like you love him. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy Lord, as we begin this holy week, we ask to be in relationship with you anew as we walk the path that you walked, God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may have a new understanding of your suffering and of your gift and of your resurrection. 
Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would always be found pleasing to you. You are my rock and you are my redeemer. And it is through my living, risen, resurrected Messiah, I pray. Amen. A moment of celebration you see with shouts of Hosanna quickly changed. Have you ever had a frenemy? Do you know what that word is? A frenemy. It's someone who would uh, present as a friend, but perhaps was not actually a friend. It was an enemy instead. Someone who appears to be a friend, but maybe might talk about you behind your back, or, you know, when you're trying to not eat cookies, they would bring you a pack of Girl Scout Thin Mints. A frenemy. By the end of the week, those who were shouting Hosanna would be shouting, crucify him. It, it seemed that they might be an enemy instead of a friend. Most often when we encounter folks like this, these frenemies, we treat them as enemies instead of friends. But that's not what Jesus does. You see, four days after this, after this triumphal entry, four days after this Passover festival, Jesus knew that time, that time was closing in. He had his disciples all around him, and he had what would be his last meal, his last supper. And he took off the outer clothing that he was wearing, and he knelt down, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. This wasn't simply an act of hygiene, but this was an act of service to the very people who would become in his life those frenemies. Now, I want you to come back Thursday night because Pastor Kelly is going to be preaching about this, and she's going to tell you more about it. But for now, no. That Jesus was serving the people who would deny and betray him. He didn't have to come in on that donkey. He could have come in on a huge war horse. He had, could have come in like a conquering king. But the scripture tells us that he came in humble. On the donkey. Signs of vulnerability. Signs of peacefulness. Christ expects the same service from us as he modeled for us. When we serve each other, we are following the example of Christ. I think about those he was serving that night. It couldn't have been easy to serve them. Judas was there. Judas would betray Christ. This afternoon, after you've had your Sunday nap, turn to Matthew chapter 26. It'll tell you about Judas. This is what it says. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs. Everybody from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. A kiss seems like a friendly thing to do, doesn't it? And then there's Peter, the one who would deny Christ. Peter was sitting outside in a courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You were with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before all them, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. And he went out to the porch, and another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, <clears throat> excuse me, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath, I do not know that man. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, you are also one of them for your accent betrays you. Have you ever betrayed Jesus? 
Have you ever denied Jesus? I think if we are honest with ourselves, we can all say, yes, I have. I've done that. I'm ashamed of it. I didn't mean to. I wish I hadn't done it. But truthfully, yes, I have. See, this is the thing, though. Jesus knew that Peter would deny. Jesus knew that Judas would betray. And he still invited them in. He still washed their feet. He loved them. Jesus has this love that is shocking to us, and it far exceeds any love that we have ever known. No matter who we are, no matter where we go, no matter how great our mistakes, our sins, no matter how great our denial or our betrayal, God is still inviting us in. And we serve the God of second and third and fourth and fifth chances because God is inviting us in again and again and again and again. This time of year, it is really easy for those, who call, for those of us who call ourselves Christians to rush from the joy of Palm Sunday and the Hosannas. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We say it, we shout it, we sing it. It's easy to go from that straight to Resurrection Day. Hallelujah, he is risen. But we forget the suffering that happens in this week. We cannot go from the joy of Palm Sunday and the crying of Hosanna, which very literally means save us, to the joy of Easter without walking through the Holy Week. We cannot see an empty tomb without that tomb first being full. And that's what this week is about. Walking with Jesus through the fullness of the tomb. And then celebrating the resurrection. Have you ever had an experience in your life when the tomb felt full? Perhaps the tomb has felt full for you when you've had bouts of loneliness. Maybe the tomb has felt full when you've had fear of losing someone that you love. It could be grief. Maybe the tomb has felt full when you go get the mail and every envelope you look at has that red stripe on the top that says final notice. The tomb feels full when those events happen in our lives. Maybe the tomb feels full when your job changes. Maybe the tomb feels full when you're holding the hand of your sick child and you're praying, God, please, please, God, we need a miracle. This is my baby, Lord. I need your healing grace. Sometimes, realistically, in our lives, the tomb feels full. Every one of us here is suffering in some way. No one has a perfect life. And I encourage you to grapple with that this week. You know, you've heard me say before that one of my favorite theologians to read is Richard Rohr. And I was reading Richard Rohr this week, and he wrote this. Until we find the communal meaning and the significance of suffering of all life, we will continue to retreat into our individual, small worlds of our misguided quest for personal safety and sanity. A crucified God is the dramatic symbol of the one suffering. That God fully enters into the suffering with us, in solidarity with us. The good news is we don't have to hold that suffering alone. As a matter of fact, we can't hold that suffering alone. 
Friends, I want to invite you to walk this Holy Week with Jesus. Examine your life. Face those issues that are causing you suffering. Face those issues that are causing the tomb to continue to feel full for you. And friends, there is a promise of resurrection. Because Sunday's coming. Easter's coming. I want to invite you again to share in Scripture with me. It's going to be from Psalm 118. Uh, We're going to do four verses, and I would ask you again to read those parts that are in bold. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, you know what, that's not bold, but let's say it together anyway. Let Israel say... His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His steadfast love endures forever. Friends, the one who rode the donkey on the dusty streets of Jerusalem, cheered by a crowd in celebration and affirmation, would then suffer the pain and humiliation of crucifixion. And that very one is inviting you into a great love, a love so great that he would die for it. And you know what? His steadfast love endures forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, may the people of God say, Amen. We want to thank you for joining us online today, and we hope and we pray that you heard a word from God today. We also want to thank you for your financial support. There are a couple of different ways that you can contribute to the work and to the ministry that God is doing in and through Powell Church. And we want to go on ahead and thank you for your commitment, uh, for your love, and for your generosity. Now remember, wherever you're at, that's where the church is, because you are the church. So go and serve God with everything that you have. Love your neighbor and give honor and glory to God in all things that you do.